Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Last time we looked at what Jesus taught about God. Although this class is called One God Overall, it's also important for us to talk about Jesus. If the Father alone is the one God overall, then what does that mean about Jesus? Who is he? We're going to take the next few sessions to explore what the Bible teaches about Jesus, and today our focus is on his primary title, Messiah. In addition, we'll briefly look at John 8.58 and whether or not Jesus claimed to be the great I Am. Here now is episode 415, part 5 of our One God Overall class. Number 5, Jesus, God's Messiah. Last time we talked about what Jesus believed about God. This time we're talking about who Jesus is. And the number one title for Jesus is Christ or Messiah. So I want to talk about that to start and uh, really ponder deeply into Scripture. What does it mean to be a Messiah? What is a Messiah? The word Meshach is a Hebrew word, means to anoint or spread. And that's where we get the word Mashiach from. It's the word translated Messiah. And that word comes into Greek as Christos or Christ. So the, the, the key word, once again, is Meshach. It's this word to anoint. And then one that is anointed is a Mashiach, which in Greek is just a Christos or Christos, if you want to be technical. Uh, so, uh, what, what does it mean to be anointed? What does it mean to be a Messiah? What does it mean to be a Christ? These are all the same thing. Let's look at the first king, because the first king will tell us exactly what we need to know as far as background information. 1 Samuel 10.1 says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not Yahweh anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of Yahweh, and you shall save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that Yahweh has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. So you have this, this word anointed repeatedly here. And what are we really talking about? We're talking about the first king of Israel, Saul. And Saul started out really good. I mean, Saul didn't end up all that well, but he had a really great start, you know. And this is, this, these are the glory days the, when he's just getting his start. And Samuel says, you know, God's chosen you. He has anointed you and you are going to rule and you're going to save Israel from her enemies. And like, that's just a really good definition of what Messiah means. All the way back then, that's pretty much what we see it to mean. Then, of course, Saul did disobey. Saul did he was a bit of a people pleaser, wasn't he? Uh, he did fall from grace, and uh, David was chosen then, 1 Samuel 16, 12. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, that's talking about little David, and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And Yahweh said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So there's that word again, anoint. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of Yahweh rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So a couple things. First of all, the first Messiah is, is Saul, in the sense of being a king. And the second one is going to be David. But notice that we're talking about something that's very physical. This is not really a metaphor, the word anoint. It means to spread, to smear, to pour oil on someone's head. right? I mean, there's a literal component here to the anointing that we see with these kings. And then once you understand the literal, you know, here's Samuel with his horn of oil and he's pouring it on this one kid in front of all his whole family and that's the anointing. And that marks him out as the one to rule the people. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 starts out with this incredibly bold, awesome first sentence. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. There's two really bold things here. I mean, being a son of Abraham is not all that bold. There's lots of sons of Abraham. You could be an Arab and be a son of Abraham, right? But uh, 
Calling Jesus in your first sentence, the Christ. I mean, my goodness, that is, that's like claiming the whole point from the first sentence. And then saying he's the son of David. Son of David is, is quite a, as we'll see, is quite a, a technical term. It could mean just David was one of your ancestors, or it could mean that you are the son of David. You see how it says it there? The son of David. Very interesting. So we have these first two kings. We have Saul. We have David. They're both anointed. And then we have Jesus, who is also called anointed, Mashiach. We don't have the oil in the case of Jesus. Instead, we have the Holy Spirit. But you have the antitype. You have the original, the prototype. And then you have what it what it prefigures, and then what it represents in Jesus with the Holy Spirit. I found this definition helpful. This is uh, from an old source, uh, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia under Messiah. They write, The term is used in the Old Testament of kings and priests who were consecrated to office by the ceremony of anointing. It is applied to the priest only as an adjective, the anointed priest. Its substantive use is restricted to the king. He only is called the Lord's Messiah, Mashiach, anointed. The Messiah is the instrument by whom God's kingdom is to be established in Israel and the world. Man, I don't think you can really improve much on that (laughs) definition. That's what a Messiah is supposed to do. That's the job of the Messiah. When I say the Messiah, I'm not just talking about any old king of Israel. I'm talking about the Messiah that we see prophesied about throughout the Bible, the ultimate Messiah. His job is to do what? It's to establish God's kingdom in Israel and the world. The hope of a personal deliverer is thus inseparable from the wider hope that runs through the Old Testament. So let's talk about three aspects of Messiah, three interchangeable terms that we see, especially in the New Testament, applied to Jesus And those are King of the Jews, Son of David, and Son of God. Let's start with King of the Jews. Uh, Because I I think for us, a Messiah is kind of of like a religious term. And uh, although it is certainly religious in the sense that God selects this person, it's profoundly political as well. At least it would be in their world. So let's look at this here. Luke 23, verse 2. I want to look at King of the Jews first, and then the other two, Son of David, Son of God. Luke 23, verse 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Isn't that interesting? And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. See how it works? Here you have these non-Jesus people, Jesus' enemies, and they're talking to Pilate and they're saying to Pilate, this guy's, this guy's the Christ. All right. Now look, if you're a Greek, if you're a Roman, you hear, you hear the word Christos, you probably think a wrestler. Because wrestlers got anointed with oil just before they competed. So they give explanation. <laughs> they give explanation. Christ, a king. You see how they do that? They're like, oh, he's a Christos, a king. You know, not a wrestler or some other definition of an, a, you know, somebody that spreads oil on themselves, right? This is, this is what we mean by Christ. We mean king. And then Pilate hears that as a Roman a government official, somebody who knows about kings, somebody who knows about authority. He says, are you the king of the Jews? So the way the Romans hear the word Christ is not as a religious term at all, as a political term related to the Jewish nation. You are the king of the Jews? And Jesus confirms that. Here's another example, John 19, verse 19. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. It's a classic Pilate moment where he's just like, I'm done with you guys. <laughs> like, I'm out. You know, he didn't really want to go through it. He, you know, he got out maneuvered. Here it is three times, right? King of the Jews, King of the Jews, King of the Jews. If you ask the Romans, why did they crucify Jesus? Their answer is, well, he said he was King of the Jews, so we had to kill him. 
It makes perfect sense, right? Like, the Romans are in charge of who's the king of what. And this guy said he was the king of what, and the Romans didn't say he was the king of what, so they executed him. Just as simple as that from a political point of view. But of course, it's more, Messiah is more than that. It's also son of David. It's also son of David. And to say son of David is to invoke the idyllic, great king, the sweet psalmist, the mighty warrior, David, the son of Jesse, in his good years. Okay? Like, we know he fell, he did some bad things. But like, there is this golden period in David's life that is held up as an example over and over throughout the book of the Kings. If you're a good king, they say, oh, he walked in the steps of his father, David. If you're a bad king, he walked in the steps of his father, Jeroboam, or some other knucklehead, right? So like, David is the, the example of a good king. And we see this also under the definition of Messiah in the ISBE. It says, in the popular conception, the Messiah was chiefly the royal son of David who would bring victory and prosperity to the Jewish nation and set up his throne in Jerusalem. Let's look at a a really great example of this is the Hosanna text. Uh, So we have it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Every one of them, when Jesus rides that donkey into Jerusalem as a public announcement that he's claiming to be the Messiah. That's what he's doing there. It's a very bold move. And Jesus is only alive like a week after he does this. Like, that's it. That's, that's the beginning of the end. And each of these is so fascinating. So in Matthew, it says, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, by the way, means save now. It's, it's asking for uh, salvation to come. Hosanna. The word na is a Hebrew word. It means now. Anyhow. In Mark, it says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Luke says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. John says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. You see, reading across the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see one of them says son of David. One of them says kingdom of our father David, actually coming kingdom of our father David. One of them says king, and one of them says king of Israel. So all together, we get a full picture of what it means to be the son of David. It means you're the king. It means you're the one that's bringing the kingdom anticipated. Pretty awesome. Uh, And we also saw that in Matthew 1.1, right? The genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, All right, let's look at the third one there, son of God. This is Probably the most interesting, so we'll spend the most time on it. What does it mean to be the Son of God in Scripture? 2 Samuel 7.14 says, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is the prophecy. This is like a little part of it. You know, it's several verses long. I just... Zeroing in on the part relevant to Jesus. This is the prophecy that David receives from God. And the prophecy is basically like after you die, there's going to be this descendant. And to this descendant, I will be to him a father. Look, if God is your father, you are his daughter, you are his son. Right? That's just by definition. So 2 Samuel 7 is this idea that there would be a son of David who will also be a son of God. This is where it begins, 2 Samuel chapter 7. And this one is not just going to rule for 40 years like David did. This this one is going to rule forever. We see something very similar in Psalm 2, verse 6. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell you the decree the, the Lord, or Yahweh, said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So we see in Psalm 2, again, God calling someone his son is tantamount to saying, you're the Messiah, you're the king, you're the one that's going to rule. When I hear the term son of God, when we hear it today in our own context, we don't think, oh, it's a political term for a king. Right? That's not obvious to us. 
But what I'm arguing is that based on 2 Samuel 7 and Psalm 2, that was obvious to them. And I'll show you this, how it is dealt with in the New Testament. Luke chapter 1, this is the Annunciation where Gabriel talks to Mary. Luke 1, 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be called Great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And in the next breath, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. You see how fast that was? And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom it will go forever, right? There will be no end. So on the one hand, you, you know, you're going to have this child. He's going to be called the Son of the Most High. And then right away, that means that, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. So these Son of God and Son of David, they're, they're just kind of used interchangeably of the Messiah. I'll show you another place. There's lots of evidence of this. John 1.49. This is uh, Nathaniel. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. This is when Jesus, uh, well, I think it was Philip, that said to Nathanael, hey, I think we found like the one. You know, he finds out he's from Nazareth. Nathanael's like, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You know, like, Psst. And then you know, he meets Jesus, and then he, you know, Jesus talks to him, and he says, oh, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You see how these two are so closely uh, align. I'm not saying they're exactly the same thing, but I am saying that they are very much connected. Uh, here's another example, Matthew 26, 63. But Jesus remained silent. This is Caiaphas confronting Jesus. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So once again, you have these two terms used interchangeably back and forth. And this is not somebody that it believes in Jesus at all. This is just a non-believing High priest, Caiaphas, who doesn't even like Jesus, to be honest. But in his head, he's, he's thinking the Christ is the Son of God. Uh, so what does Son of God even mean? Let's talk about the two meanings that we've just seen here. Definition one would be a synonym for Messiah or King. I'll show you this. This is from Chronicles, but it's the same thing we already saw from Samuel. First Chronicles 17, 11. When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers... He's talking to David. I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So it's inherently Davidic, messianic, political rulership that's all bound up in the term son of God at this prophecy. And we see that borne out in the New Testament. But that's not all son of God means. Son of God also means that God is Jesus' actual father. Jesus does not have a human biological father. I mean, he had Joseph, but Joseph was not with Mary to produce Jesus, right? So God is literally his father. And that's what we see in Luke one thirty-five. This is an important verse. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, that child to be born will be called the Son of God. What do you mean, therefore? What do you mean, therefore? He says, therefore is like an arrow. It's saying, because of this, that. Right? What's the because of this? Because of the Holy Spirit overshadowing you. Basically, because of this miracle occurring, the child is going to be called the Son of God. You know, because God is literally his father, he's going to be called the son of God. So both, both of those are true, that the son of God means you know, a political messiah, but also the son of God means that God's your father. In uh, Jesus' case, a very literal sense. Right? All right, so that's a little bit about messiah. It's, it's not all that complicated, but it is like the main identity title for Jesus. In other words, like if Jesus had a business card, this is kind of silly, but like if Jesus had a business card, what would he put on there for his title? Would it be CEO of the age to come? You know, uh, <laughs> would it be like rabbi? Would it be prophet? I mean, yes, I mean, he's, he's all these different things, right? Jesus is awesome. Jesus did it all, right? But the one title we find for Jesus more than anyone, anyone any other is Christ or Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth, that's like his name, Messiah. I think that's what he would put on his business card.
I think that's how he would self-identify. He was a little um, hesitant in his earthly ministry to tell people he was the Messiah because it was such an explosive, exciting, and polarizing thing to say. So he kind of kept it on the down low until the triumphal entry and then everyone's singing and shouting and, and he's just like, look, if, if these people don't sing and shout, then the, the stones will cry out. I mean, it's go time. Let's tell, it, let's tell the world, right? And then after the resurrection, he commissions, go and tell, right? Go make disciples. So it's not a secret. We should tell people Jesus is the Messiah. All right, but I did also want to look at another important verse, and that's John 8.58. It's a verse very frequently referred to in order to make the case that Jesus just is God, or is God in some sense. And so John 8.58 in the ESV says, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, before Abraham was I am. And in the New Living Translation, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was ever born, was, was even born, I am. And uh, I want to just do a little bit of business with this verse and uh, give a couple of thoughts about it. There's a couple of unusual things going on here. Uh, and I want to draw your attention to the left side of the screen because here we have I am all capitalized. Over on the ESV side, I am is lowercase. On the NLT side, it's all capitalized. That's weird. You know, you see something that's all capitalized, it should get your attention. Now, uh, we do have that in the Old Testament, right? Lord with all capitals. That's signaling to us that this is the name of God, Yahweh. So maybe that's what they're doing here. Maybe they're doing something else. And the other thing that's weird in both of these translations is the Yoda talk. Before Abraham was, I am. I mean, that's just a weird sentence. I think we can agree on that. So happy for you, I am. What? <laughs> Before getting here at home, I was. <laughs> like, we just don't talk that way. We don't dangle the subject off the end of the sentence normally. So many of us are so used to seeing John 8.58 this particular way that we think to ourselves, well, it must just have to be translated in this word order. No, not at all. In fact, translators are always adjusting the word order. You almost never see the actual word order of the Greek New Testament when you read an English translation. And that's good, because the Greeks, did, they just do things in a different order. And it's not even consistent. Like, sometimes they'll put something out front that we would put out back, and sometimes they don't. You know, it's just, it's a different language. So, why didn't they reorder it here? It's kind of strange. So, it's just a little something to think about. John 8.58, uh, verses 8.46. Now, look, both of these are very similar in that, well, let me read John 8, 46. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? So we have the word I am here. It's in the same chapter, same version of the Bible. We have I am in verse 46 and verse 58. But in verse 46, it's not capitalized. In verse 58, it is capitalized. What's the deal with the capital? Like, what are they just like willy-nilly capitalizing some I am's in the chapter and not others? Yes, they are. The NLT capitalizes three I am's, uh, either three or four, in chapter 8 of John, and then nowhere else in the whole New Testament. So, what is going on? Actually, I am occurs 1,196 times in the NLT, that particular combination of words. But there's only two places. One is John 8, and the other is Exodus chapter 3. Those are the only two places in the New Living Translation, where we have this capitalized I am. We're going to take a look at that in a second. I just want to show you the phrase. The phrase in Greek that's getting translated I am is ego emi. Ego emi. Ego is just the word for waffle. No, just kidding. Ego means your ego, your, your, you know, I. That's what it means. It means I. Always. It doesn't, it doesn't really have any other different definitions. It just means I or me, right? Imi is the verb to be. It means, and this is the first person, so it means I am. But there are lots of different ways you can translate that depending on the grammar and what's going on in the verse. You can translate it I am. You can translate it it's me. You can translate it I am he. You can translate it I am the one. And you can translate it I have been, depending on what's going on in the sentence around it. Okay, what's the context? So, for example, the blind man, just in you know, 10 verses later, John 9, 9, they asked him, is this really the blind man? Was he really the one that was 
you know, we all knew it was the blind man. Are we sure this is really the same guy? Because he's not blind anymore. Are we sure? And the blind man says, Ego with me! And they translate it, I am the one. There's no capitals. There's no weirdness. It's just like, I, yeah, I'm that guy. That's all he's saying. So it's not a mystical phrase. It's just like the words I am in English. Uh, so what is going on? Well, I could tell you what's going on. There, uh, the NLT and other translations that do this with the capitalizing, they're trying to make us, it's like an arrow pointing back to Exodus 3.14. And uh, in Exodus 3.14, in the NLT, we read, God replied to Moses, I am who I am. There we got it. Now it's all capitalized. You see that? So this is the, the connection. Uh, Say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Uh, John Golden Gay's translation, John Golden Gay is a, uh, I think he's a British scholar who partnered with N.T. Wright, and they, they came out with the Bible for everyone. That's what it's called. Uh, he's a Christian. He says, God said to Moshe, I will be what I will be. He said, say this to the Israelites, I will be sent me to you. And then Robert Alter, not a Christian, he's a Jewish scholar out in California. A couple of years back, he came out with his own translation, very well-respected scholar. Um, and God said to Moses, Ehiyah, Esher, Ehiyah, I will be who I will be. And he said, thus you shall say to the Israelites, Ehiyah sent me to you. Interesting. So this phrase, the big question is, well, how do you translate it? How do you translate it? Well, if you know uh, Hebrew grammar, you can see that this is uh, what they call an imperfect or imperfective aspect, which usually maps onto the future tense in English, usually. They have perfect, then they have participles, and then they have imperfect. Those are kind of like the three tenses. It's not exactly lined up on English tenses because Hebrew is just so different. But uh, typically, perfect tenses or perfective aspect we translate as past tense. Participles we translate as present tense. And then imperfect we translate as future tense. There are exceptions to that, but just simplifying, this is what we would expect to be a future tense, which is why John Golden Gay, whose translation is not based on the King James, is not a revision in, in line with other translations. It's a fresh translation. As a Hebrew scholar, he says, oh, this is just I will be what I will be. And then Robert Alter, you can see he, he gets a little nervous. He's like, well, I'm not really sure. So he just turns the Hebrew into English letters. Ehiyah, asher, ehiyah. And then, he, and then he does hazard a translation. I will be who I will be. And then he goes right back to the Hebrew letters again. So you can see there's like some confusion. There's some like uncertainty about it. But it doesn't just say I am. That's my point. It's like, if I'm reading this, I'm not thinking I am is, is the correct translation. So that's, that's troubling. When we see Exodus 3.14 in the New Living Translation, uh, and I, I'm not trying to single this translation out. It's just illustrated this one point, okay? Uh, I'm sure there are many great things about the NLT as well. I'm not trying to, like, assassinate somebody here. But I, I do want to raise an issue with this particularly where it says, I am has sent me to you, right? And then on John 8, 58, has that I am. And my question is, is that what Jesus was saying? Is that what Jesus was saying? Was Jesus saying, I was there at the burning bush. Exodus 3, that's the burning bush. That's where God speaks to Moses. And Moses says, what do I tell him your name is? It's like one of Moses' like three or four excuses why he can't be the guy. Well, if they ask me for your name, what do I tell him then? At least how I read it. And God says, well, you know, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. Another translation, I will cause to be who I will cause to be, or what I will cause to be. There's a lot of possibilities there. Uh, is Jesus trying to refer us to the burning bush here, or what is Jesus actually doing? Hmm. Well, first of all, my first point is this. Exodus 3.14 doesn't say I am in the Hebrew. I tried to make that case by showing you a couple of translations. It's not, it's not a cut and dry, hey, the Hebrew just says I am. No, it doesn't. It's probably I will be or I will cause to be. Number two, Exodus 3.14 doesn't say I am in the Greek. We don't have time to get into this, but there's an ancient Greek translation that was around at the time of Christ called the Septuagint. And in the ancient Greek translation, they translate it the one who is or the being. Number three, why would Jesus 
reveal his identity to his enemies in a heated exchange in John 8, 58. If you get a chance to read John 8 on your own, it's the Who's Your Daddy chapter, where <laughs> Jesus says, he always talks about like how God is his father. And like, so his enemies say, well, God's not your father. You know, you're, you're born of fornication, you know, and Jesus is like, well, the devil's your father. That's why I say it's the who, Who's Your Daddy chapter. Because like they're in this heated exchange, Jesus against his enemies. And do you think that like to his enemies, this is where he's going to reveal his true identity to these unbelievers that are like harassing him? I seriously doubt it. He would reveal that to his disciples in the upper room discourse, John 14, 15, 16. You know, that's where you would reveal private information about your true identity. But like to his enemies, seems a little out of place for the Gospel of John. And number four, the phrase ego in me is translated differently in John 8, 18, verse 24, and verse 28. There it's often translated, I am he. Or John 9, 9 is rendered, I am the one or I am the man. So this phrase, ego in me, is translated differently in the same chapter by the same translation than it is in verse 58. So these are, all, these are all like red flags for me that this is not the best translation. This is actually the case of bias. So what is Jesus claiming here in John 8, 58, when he says, before Abraham was, ego me. He's not claiming to be God. That's just not what he's doing. Or if he is doing it, it's not doing it in a very clear way that they would have, they would have picked up on. So he could be claiming to pre-exist, that he existed before Abraham, whether literally or in God's plan. Or he could be claiming, well, we know from Genesis 3, talking about God's plans, right? You had Abraham. Abraham's what? Genesis 12? So Genesis 3, already then, God's got this prophecy, right, that the the seed of the woman, the descendant of the woman, is going to crush the head of the snake. We already know that there's a prophecy of a deliverer to come. We know that Messiah is prophesied already from chapter 3. Like, they're still in the garden, and there's a prophecy. We also know from 1 Peter that he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, right? So, like, as far as the timeline of prophecy goes and God's thinking, the Messiah is way before Abraham. Way before. So that's, that's very, very much a possibility. Uh, I go into this in great detail, about 30 minutes, just on this one issue and all the complexity of the translation issues in uh, episode 22 of How We Got the Bible, did Jesus claim to be the great I am in John 8, 58? So go check that out if you want to go deeper on this. I'd like to close today with John 20, verse 31. John 20, verses 30 and 31 are the closing conclusion of the Gospel of John in the sense of like giving a purpose statement for what he's doing. There, there is a little, there's more material. There's chapter 21. But that's kind of like more of an appendix. You know, this is like really the purpose statement here. John 20, verse 30 says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Hmm. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. The point, John 8, 58, just remember, is in the Gospel of John. Okay, so he gets to the end of the book and he's like, all right, guys, I'm going to tell you why I wrote what I wrote. Jesus did lots of other stuff. I did not write about that. I put this in because I want, it's it's persuasive. It's not just a biography, it's a persuasive, it's an evangelistic biography. I want you to believe by all the stuff that I have in here that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's what he wants people to believe. Now, Once again, Messiah, Christ, Son of God, this is N.T. Wright, is the coming king who would be David's true heir through whom Yahweh would rescue Israel from pagan enemies. So Messiah is not Yahweh. He's the one through whom Yahweh rescues the people. But here's my question. Let's just assume I'm wrong about this for a second. Let's do a little thought experiment. Let's assume that Pastor Sean's just out to lunch, okay? And that uh, the Gospel of John really does say that Jesus is God. All right, well, on the one hand, you've got God. On the other hand, you've got Messiah. Who in the world would care that Jesus is the Messiah if he's also God? I mean, God is so much bigger. It's like saying, yeah, I'm an office worker and, you know, I'm the CEO. 
<laughs> Who cares if you're an office worker? I mean, let's say you're writing a biography of a famous person, say somebody who died in the year 1931, Lillian Leitzel. She happens to enjoy playing the piano, but she's also the best aerial acrobat of the 20th century, whirling around on those rings, just putting her audiences in awe and disbelief with like what she can do up in the air. You go to write this biography, you're going to write the definitive biography for this little-known acrobat, and, and you write it all out, and then in the conclusion you say, I have written these things. She had done many other things, but I wrote these things that you would believe that she really did enjoy playing the piano on occasion. No. Who cares if she played the piano? She's the best acrobat of the 20th century. That's why you're writing a biography about her. Lots of people play the piano. So it is with Jesus. If Jesus is the Messiah and God, who cares that he's the Messiah? He's, if he's God, then like that's just obviously so much more important. It would eclipse, it would stand out front of his messianic identity. So let's review. Number one, every Christian can agree with this. Jesus is the Messiah. Number two, a Messiah is someone anointed by God to rule over the world and usher in the messianic age. Number three, Messiah is interchangeable with King of the Jews, Son of David, and Son of God. Number four, Son of God has two meanings, maybe more than that, but not less, right? One, a synonym for Messiah, and two, that God is Jesus' actual Father. Five, notwithstanding translation bias, John 8, 58 does not imply that Jesus claimed to be the I Am of Exodus 3, 14. And last of all, number six, if Jesus is both Messiah and God, his divinity would eclipse his anointed role. All right, so that's enough on Messiah. Next up, we're going to look at Jesus as God's subordinate son as we continue through our class, One God Overall. Well, that's it for part five, Jesus as Messiah, and exploring John 8.58 a little bit. As I mentioned, go check out podcast episode 351 to hear a much more in-depth take on did Jesus claim to be the I Am in John 8.58. That was from last summer, and it goes into a lot more depth. You know, what I'm doing here is making sure that people at least get the surface level, the initial understanding of a number of these confusing verses, especially the way our translations have them, many of them, then referring people to digging deeper. So hopefully that works as a, a strategy not to overdo some of the complexities that maybe not everyone's interested in, at least at this moment, while they're going through the class, but also provide them with ways to dig deeper. If you have questions on this episode or comments, come on to restitutio.org and find episode 415, Jesus the Messiah, and leave your thoughts there. We'd love to hear from you. Also wanted to let you know that our website, restitutio.org, is now available in dark mode. Oh yeah. I am a huge fan of dark mode, have been for many, many, many years. I'm so glad the operating systems are finally catching up and then I don't have to use more complicated ways to get all the white space off my screen and switch it to black so that I can look at my screen for long periods of time and not strain my eyes. But anyhow, phones are now supporting dark mode, tablets are, I think, and certainly desktops. So whether you have a PC or a Mac or an Apple or a Galaxy or whatever you got, if you want to go to reststudio.org and read especially long articles like my latest called The Father is Greater Than I, Exploring Biblical Subordination, it's over 20 pages long, and that would be a lot on the eyes if you were staring at a white screen. So hit that little moon icon in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, and it will go to dark mode. Or if your device is already set in dark mode, it'll just automatically detect that and you'll be able to read in comfort. And if it's bright out and you want to go to daytime mode, even just on the website, even though your device is in dark mode, you just hit that little moon, psh, it goes right to white mode. Love this plugin. So happy with it. Thanks, everyone, for listening in to the end here. We'll see you next week. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can do that at our website, restitutio.org. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.